Well, welcome everybody. Again, you guys already know me, I'm Jeff Watts, and I've been doing a lot of these uh, Friday Night Lives. And we're also, you know, doing a, a little sequence of podcasts that I'll be starting to do. And this is the first real, well, probably the second one. We did one on the guilds a little while back. Um, the one I wanna talk about right now, the subject I really is close to my heart and one that I've spent most of my life um, delving into, understanding, trying to, trying to understand is training. And training in art is a very mysterious uh, thing. I mean, I don't, when I was coming up, I didn't really hear a lot about, you know, how does one train? What kind of techniques does one use? Yeah, of course you knew you knew how to draw. You had to, need to learn how to paint. But aside from that, how does one go about learning how to draw and learning how to paint? How does someone break down their daily repertoire so that they know uh, in their schedule how to, to do long-term, short-term, mid-term goals, um, goal setting, um, you know, visualization techniques, manifesting, uh, things that a lot of people um, don't really even spend any time thinking about in the arena of art training. So what I wanted to talk about today is do a little bit of a um, exploration of the concepts of training and how one goes about training intelligently in the arts, because it doesn't differ all that much from other endeavors that require huge amounts of repetition, things of uh, athletics, uh, music. Um, a lot of the arts share that common denominator of repetition. And repetition is something that I was never really told when I started school. Um, it seemed like maybe to some, it seems like maybe common sense, but I, it, I don't see that in my students. A lot of times they really struggle with this idea of either thinking that they either were supposed to have some God-given gift that allowed them to paint and draw, some genetic predisposition, which yes, there are aptitudes. You know, I've, I'm definitely visually wired. So I have a tendency to learn through visual means. Um, and I always have ever since I was a little tiny guy. Uh, other people are academic and they learn mathematics or they're really fluent in, uh, in maybe history or English or they excel in certain things. So why should art be any different? But what we're gonna talk about today is a little bit of my background. I'll start out with a little, inter you know, this is kind of the introduction and this is me talking about how I am wired. I knew I had a very unique wiring at a very young age. My parents did as well. My father's an artist, an incredibly accomplished painter. You guys have seen him on the online program, some of you. And he um, is very, very gifted and skilled. So I, genetically, yes, I probably had a predisposition to some degree towards uh, the arts. But that being said, my dad did not sit me down and just all of a sudden infuse into me or inject into me this knowledge of how to be a good painter or how to be a good draftsman. I had to do it through the old fashioned sweat equity, get in there, spend thousands and thousands of hours on all these different concepts and find a way to navigate through this myriad of, of um, complexities that, that encapsulate this, this artistic journey. And so um, I did a blog post also on my artistic journey, which shows you some of the plateaus and some of the different styles of painting that I've explored on my way to where I am now. And I'm still in the process of that. So there is really no definitive time with which you sit down and say, I have become this great artist and this is how I work. It's always uh, a metamorphosis. There's lots of change that you have to embrace. There's lots of uh, spiritual aspects to this journey that we're gonna go on together, hopefully. And so if not, if you're just watching this on YouTube and you're just wanting to get a little bit of insight into what I know about training, then hopefully this will be a, a good uh, precursor to maybe making some good decisions on where you're going to go to school, how you're going to spend your energy, your time, because that's what we're really struggling with is our time. That's our, our most valuable asset. So uh, my background was in athletics. I wanted to be a professional athlete. Um, some of you already know that from uh, watching maybe little clips online or something. So I trained uh, in very obscure uh, athletic endeavors, uh, competitive cycling, for example, uh, soccer, things like that. Soccer wasn't quite as cryptic as cycling was, but I had to learn how to uh, train, how to eat, how to when to train, um, how much to train, what types of training. And I had no access to coaches and the sport in the United States at the time was not very well known. So you were kind of left on your own and there was no internet at this time. So you couldn't just go and look up training regimens for a cyclist. Uh, sprint training, long distance training, interval training, these different styles of training to work different aspects of the sport. So I don't wanna to get too far into that. What I'm saying is that I had to learn how to self-educate myself intelligently in areas like athletics. So when it came time for me to go to art school, uh, the high school I was in was absolutely ridiculous. 
uh, I think the PE teacher uh, subbed as the uh, art teacher, which he knew absolutely nothing. So I drew way better than him uh, and knew a lot more than him because of my father. So I didn't even take art in high school. And a lot of high schools, unfortunately, are in that predicament. The arts get cut. There's not a lot of room for these visual learners. So you get shuffled off into some other academic pursuit that really isn't your forte, isn't the way you think. And you have to put, uh, you know, a, a round object into a square, uh, you know, hole. Just like that old, uh, when you were a kid and you're trying to, you know, fit things, geometric shapes into the right place. So what I found is that uh, I didn't even bother doing art. Um, I did it from a young age, but elementary schools weren't much better. So when it came time for me to look for schooling, for training, um, I ventured into, my father had gone to Art Center and he went to Pratt, New York in the 60s. And those are a New York school and an LA school, and they're very expensive boutique art schools. And my dad, you would think, would have wanted me to go to those schools, but he wanted me to go anywhere but those schools. And I'm not here to really bash on any particular school. Um, I'm here just simply to enlighten or to share knowledge of what I understand about the positives and negatives of these different institutions of learning for art. And this is all we're talking about right now is not, we're not talking about becoming a doctor. We're not talking about becoming an engineer. We're not talking about becoming uh, an accountant or a lawyer or any of those things, because those are where the four-year universities excel. And that's what we're going to talk about, programs. So the first program that you guys are going to be looking into is probably normal universities. You're going to come out of high school and you're going to say, oh, I need to go to a really expensive art school like Art Center, or I need to go to UCLA, or I need to go to Stanford, or I need to go to Oxford. Um, these are not good art schools, right? Uh, Oxford and Stanford do not excel in the arts. So if you want to go become a lawyer, you want to become a doctor, those are great schools. Excellent. Best in the world. You want to go, you want to learn to, you know, how to navigate these myriads of choices that you're going to have, because this could be the definitive decision on whether you succeed becoming a working artist or you don't. And so the four-year universities, the UC schools, the state schools, and the community colleges are an option. But in my opinion, the biggest difficulty with these options and why they don't work is simply because of the accreditation process and the inability for the individual to be able to take classes repetitiously until they master, as well as not being able to pick the instructor with which you want to learn from. And we'll get into this when we get down into the ateliers, you'll see what the difference is. So the four-year programs, not a huge fan. Uh, a lot of the parents are going to want you to go in that direction because uh, that generation, it was more common that you would go and get a degree and that would help you to get a job that was um, out, out there in the real world. So again, you guys are going to, uh, some of you I'm assuming are fairly young and are looking into, again, the, this, what, what your options are for training. And some of you are already accomplished, are already gone through colleges, have already uh, had careers, and you are looking to do art more as a really, maybe as a professional, a second profession, maybe a third profession. Um, that's fine as well. So this will work for all of you as far as the information I'm giving you, I'm sure. The second is the specialty schools. So we have our, you know, the first rung of schools. And then when we talk about specialty schools, we get into AI, we get into San Francisco Academy, RISD, um, Art Center, uh, you know, all these really boutique schools, uh, art schools. And they are really good at certain things. Um, some of them excel in very specific areas, like Art Center is incredible at industrial design, uh, very specific areas. But if you want to be like an illustrator, a conceptor, a visual development, fine artist, there's really no, it's very difficult for me to put my seal or my recommendation on going to a school as outrageously expenses, expensive as these ones. And just go look into it for yourself and look into the cost of a four-year uh, education at a place like San Francisco Academy Art Center, probably up in the $150,000 to $200,000 range, okay? So very, very expensive. Good but have the same similar problems as the initial um, schools, which is they're accredited, which means you have to go in a very specific manner. You can't uh, take what you want when you want as many times as you want, which is what is really necessary. You can't study with who you want because if you allowed someone to do that in a school like that, everyone would be log jammed into one fantastic teacher. Like uh, say maybe you had Harry Carmian or you had... Uh, someone of that caliber or, you know, teaching at, at somewhere like Art Center, everyone's going to want to take with Harry. So there'd be five other teachers with nobody in their class. Um, so they have to shuffle you through and you don't get to train with Harry Carmian. You might get him for three classes the whole time you're there for the four years that you're there. And you're not going to learn that much from anybody in four years. I don't care if it was Michelangelo. Um, you would need them for four years. 
uh, that one instructor learning the depth of their knowledge and the, through repetition and through subtle training. So again, the boutique art schools are better than the other schools I mentioned, but outrageously expensive and still kind of somewhat uninf- ineff- inefficient in putting in place an intuitive knowledge base, which is absolutely imperative to working as a professional. Okay. So now once we go past that option, then we run into the ateliers. Now, obviously I'm going to be a big fan of ateliers because I, I've owned one and, and ran one now for 23 years. I went to one and trained in that lineage. And what an atelier is, is it's a more intimate style of training. And, and it's so it's, it's a French word meaning studio environment. And basically in the old French system of training, you would come in and you would train under a master for however long it took you to become a master. And that might've been five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. There was no definitive time with which you left. It was a process that occurred organically and you worked with a master that really understood the trials and tribulations of becoming a master, right? So this is where um, ateliers are far superior in my opinion, because you can train with who you want, you can train as many times as you want in the areas until you understand the concepts and become intuitive at them. And they usually are at a fraction of the cost because they're run by artists. Now, when you get into ateliers, you still have to be very careful because you're going to have every Tom, Dick and Harry putting out their sign saying, hey, I can't really make it as a professional artist. So I think I'll teach and I think I'll I'll run an atelier because it seems like an easy way to make some money. So you're going to see a lot of that happening. And so what you want to do is be very Uh, Do your due diligence, which means do your research ahead of time. A good place to go to do this is Art Renewal Center, which is ARC, which we are a part of. We were one of the first, I think, five ateliers to be fully accredited. Our program was fully accredited by them. Now, this is not a government accreditation. So does it, in some ways, it may hold more water, right? Because in the professional arena of art, you're working with people that understand that why they're hiring you is so that you can execute at a certain level for them to make them money. So like, say you go to DreamWorks or Disney and you want to be a conceptor for them. They're going to look at, can you do all these different things and can you make us money? They're not, they don't care if you have a master's degree, a PhD. They don't care if you went to Stanford. They don't care if you went to art center. They look at your portfolio and they want to see quality. And then if your quality is high enough, they will try you out. If you can execute for them, you will keep the job. If you can't execute for them, you will lose the job. And it doesn't matter how many degrees you have behind your name. You have to be able to execute on command. And that means you have to be intuitive with your knowledge base. So ateliers offer a more reasonable option for many people to train with some of the best talent uh, and to basically get as good as you can underneath that that uh, that that uh, person that runs that school. So you want to look into the mission of the statement of the school. You want to look into people that came out of the school, the work of the instructors at the school, and you want to make sure that your instructors are going to be able to sit down with you, demonstrate in front of you every class, and work on your work every class. Those are the definitive things, and that's what ateliers offer. Now again, I'm just going over options for your training. The next one, which is the last one I'm going to talk about, is the online option of training, which is now something that we offer. And again, a lot of this sounds like it's padded towards, hey, look at us. You know, we're an atelier. We have an online school. Come to us. You can do whatever you want, and you're going to do that anyway. So all I'm trying to do is give you the proper information with which to make an intelligent decision on the type of training uh, facility that you may want to venture into. Um, and at that time, next, we're going to talk about actually training in that in those, in that that area and how that looks. So on the online, the big positive that I see over an actual atelier even is simply repetition. Because what happens in an atelier, which I absolutely love, is you have an incredibly robust environment, hopefully run by an incredibly skilled person or people, artists, that were hopefully trained in a similar lineage so you don't get too confused. That's another thing I did not mention in the earlier is a lot of times in these other schools, you have too many cooks in the kitchen and too many people teaching too many systems that aren't consistent. So it confuses the newer students rather than helps them. An atelier will have a tendency to have a certain um, way of teaching that they're known for. We happen to be known for the Riley method or in that lineage. Other ones are known for site size. Other ones uh, follow other lineages. So you want to find the one that has a lineage that most resonates with you and your goals and what how you want to operate. So the online school allows you to watch me do something, for example, over and over and over, 
and you can watch me lay in an eye 52 times, 152 times. If you were at the atelier watching me lay in that demo, you would not be able to take video and therefore you would probably be at some more abstract angle because you're not gonna be right over my head seeing through my eyes like you are on the, on, online. So what you're gonna get is unfortunately um, a small percentage of retention. So in order to retain what I just taught you, you might have to see 20 or 30 different demos. Okay, online you won't get the variety of the 30 demos, but you'll get a heavier retention by watching it over and over, being able to do that. And so that, and also just the luxury of being able to train in your own comfort of your own home at any time when you want uh, is, is, in, is, you can't even put a price on that. So what I think the most ideal scenario is, is to be ideally in a school like Atelier, like, like Watts Atelier, and then be on the online program for your homework. So you have, because one thing that when you're learning the arts, I tried to learn piano a few years ago, and I always had wanted to since I was a kid, and, and, and I had an okay instructor, but he would come in, and he would show me a few things. And I would get it, and I'd be doing good, and he would leave. And when he left, I had nothing. I couldn't remember anything. I didn't have anything to look at. And I was really completely lost until he came back. So I couldn't do much even practice because I couldn't remember how to practice what he showed me. So I noticed that that's a, a recurring issue with a lot of people. And one thing that they do not tell you in art school is that what you learn, you have to remember. And the only way to remember something is to repeat it until you can do it without looking at it. So if you want to draw an eye in three quarters, you have to draw eyes in three quarters from Loomis, from casts, from life, until you can draw that eye believably with nothing in front of you. Then you know that information. And most people do not understand that concept. You know, you go in, you take algebra, you get an A, you go to algebra two, you pass that, you get a B, then you go to pre-cal or trigonometry, whatever, and you work your way up the uh, ladder of mathematics. And you don't go back and and remember everything in Algebra 1, I'll, I mean, like, just grill it and grill it and have to remember it and memorize it. I mean, you do, but it's a little different. Visual information can only be retained through proper repetition, and that repetition has to be guided by someone that already has done it, knows how to do it, and what we call this is putting an eye in place. So when you go to school, an atelier, you're basically leasing my eyeballs until yours see like mine. Right, And that could be a year, two years, five years, 10 years. No one could tell you how long that's gonna take. There is no definitive way to do that that I've ever seen. So the ateliers are a little bit more rogue. They're gonna get, uh, there's gonna be a little bit more ups and downs because they're run by artists. Artists don't always notoriously run business as well. So it's hard to find one that can do both. So you wanna just do your due diligence, um, do your research online. It's an easy to do now and really take your time because you could save yourself a lot of grief a lot of money and a lot of frustration if you make the right decision. If you make the wrong decision, you could basically write yourself out of being a professional working artist, almost guaranteed. So that being said, um, we're gonna get into next talking about the various phases of your training from the first one to three years to the three to five years and the five to 10 years and what those are gonna look like as your training. So you'll get a little bit of better understanding of the overall a uh, big picture of what it's going to take to move through uh, all this knowledge that you're going to need to go out and have fun uh, working as a professional artist. And it is a wonderful way to make a living. So don't sell yourself short. Don't let the naysayers, uh, you know, keep you from following your dreams. Uh, just make intelligent decisions so that your dreams can become a reality. Okay, so we talked a little bit about school options, like what, you know, actual brick and mortar schools versus online schools versus ateliers. And we got a little bit better understanding now of, of kind of what our options are as far as where we could go to train. Now, once you find your, make your decision, whatever it may be, you're going to find yourself at that school and you're going to have to now figure out how do you actually assimilate the information that's in that school? How do you, how do you pull that information out of your instructor, get it into your head, get it to come out through your hands and to produce excellent work. And that's easier said than done. You might have a phenomenal teacher, but does that teacher have a vested interest in getting you better than them? Do they shut down when they start seeing that you're getting really good in certain areas? Are they an open book and are they extremely generous with their knowledge? These are all things that you have to start training yourself to be able to perceive and understand and see in your instructors. Because certain instructors, you know, they're good when you're new and they're not so good when you start to encroach on their skill levels. Um, I've seen that happen many times. 
Um, so there's lots of little pitfalls and things that we have to start thinking about as far as taking accountability for our own education, not saying, oh, I went to this really expensive school, therefore I'm going to be good. That's no guarantee whatsoever. And any school that guarantees you that, which I have heard some of them say, oh, you know, sign up with us. We'll get you a job. We have a great um, 75 percent, uh, uh, you know, percentage of people working professionally. What you don't know about that is that, that they consider you working at an art store as working in an art industry. That's what I found out later. I was like, well, you got to be kidding me. You spent 200 grand and I'm working at Dick Blick selling art supplies. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about going out and working in those upper echelon jobs, which are the five to 10 percent in the world talent, right? That's you want to work at Pixar. You want to work at DreamWorks. You want to work at Rockstar top 5% in the world. That's what you got to be not in the 15, 20% tile or whatever, which would still be impressive, but not going to do it. So what we want to do is when we start talking about our daily regimen that we employ to allow the information to be absorbed, digested into our brain and then memorized and then executed out of our hand to allow us to draw a nice head, to paint a beautiful eye, to indicate like Fetchin or someone like that. These are, this is where they, they, to me, most systems of education presently do not do a good job of preparing you for the rigors of training or what that even means. Um, when I was in school, no one sat me down and said, okay, here's how you set up a training regimen. Here's what you should be doing in the morning. Here's what you should be doing in the afternoon. Here's what you should be doing in the evening. Here's the books you should be studying. Here's what you should be studying in those books. Here's how you should be studying them. Here are some techniques for memorizing this visual information. And here's how you go about absorbing this, this content. I had to figure all that out on my own. And luckily, luckily I came from an art, a background of self-education in athletics learning how to train, learning how to find obscure pieces of information, seeking out people that knew what they were talking about, learning how to listen to the right ones, learning how to pick the right ones, learning how to avoid the ones that were wasting my time, and then cut to the chase and get as good as I can as fast and efficiently as I could. Um, and again, a lot of you are going to want to race through school and go out to make money. That is not the mentality of a working artist. First, passion and love of the craft. Second, then is working. But that love of the craft must be instilled in the individual and it's best done by an inspirational teacher that has your best interest at hand. That's what you got to find. Okay. So you've got to become a very astute uh, student of character. You have to be able to see that character in your teachers, understand what it looks like, understand what it's like. People like Robert Henri, Howard Pyle, um, Andrew Loomis, William Merritt Chase, these are the, uh, the, the grand masters of teaching. These are the ones that we look to still long after they're gone for inspiration in how do we navigate this pathway towards mastery in the arts? Well, um, let's say, for example, the first, what does the first one to three years look like when you, when you come into our atelier or when you start training in this method? Well, time allocation. Some of you are going to be good at it. Some of you are going to be horrendous at it. How does one allocate? How does one piece out their time to allow them to do the studying and, and, and the work that needs to be done? Now, if you're 17, 18 years old and you've got no mortgage and you've got no kids and you've got no job and you've got no wife or husband, you're in good shape, right? You're, you're traveling lean. You got some time. But most people at that age do not appreciate the time they have and do not understand how to allocate it, use it. So they waste a lot of it. Okay. Some of you are coming in and you already got two kids in tow and you got a mortgage and you got a job that you're not too happy with. And you think you want to become a working professional artist. Well, you got a long road to hoe and it's a very, very strong uphill battle. Is it doable? Yes, but not if you can't allocate your time and you can't understand how to navigate. So the first thing you have to do is develop short-term, mid-term and long-term goals. So let's say uh, a short-term goal would be, I want to be proficient at head lay-ins in the next six months. Okay, we can do that. Now, how do we do that? Well, we've got to go to the right sources. Well, it would be help if we had a teacher like myself or Eric or one of the guys at our atelier, and you could come in and take 20-minute head lay-ins, head drawing, features and facial expressions, and things of that sort. Well, that would help because we'd give you that structure from which to train in. Um, you have to have the right books at home, right? So if you go and you say, okay, I want to learn how to do head lay-ins, and you go to sit down and draw, but you got nothing to draw from or you're drawing from some book that does 
the guy draws really bad heads, but you don't know it yet because your eye can't perceive that. And here you are studying these heads from this guy and you're starting to pick up his technique for drawing heads, which is not very sound, not very well developed. You are going to draw like that person. So you're basically putting in information that later has to be removed by someone that's incredibly knowledgeable, which the chances of meeting one of those people or being able to go to a school with one of those people is very rare. Okay. So what we have is we have short-term, mid-term, long-term goals. What I want you to do in these first period of your training is go out to like Home Depot or one of these um, business, you know, stores that sells business uh, items, you know, printers and printer paper, all that kind of stuff and buy yourself a cheap uh, or you can do this on your iPad or whatever on your calendar function or whatever. I'm kind of old school. So you go get one of these old, these calendars that breaks your day down into half an hour increments and you start listing what are my obligations each week for working out, for eating, for when do I sleep? When do I hang out with my partner? When do I um, do all these things? Everything that you have to do. So you get some highlight markers, different colors, and you know, pink highlighter is for work, and the green highlighter is for studying, and the orange highlighter is for working out. And you basically fill in everything that's mandatory, and you highlight it out, right? And you do a little legend for yourself, like I just mentioned. And you start to see what kind of time you're really working with. What kind of life are you working with? And this might mean jettisoning some things that you used to like to do. Can't watch Housewives of Orange County. Can't watch, uh, you know, whatever. Um, you might have to put those on, on, on hold and say, okay, that's an hour that I could be drawing. That I sit and I watch some, you know, uh, reality TV show or something or Dance with the Stars. I don't know, whatever. You do need some downtime. But if you want to be serious about this and you have a tough life uh, designed for yourself or, or, or whatever you find yourself in, you're going to have to make some sacrifices. And that's the first thing we have to realize. Got to jettison some stuff that we don't need so that we can make time for this because this is going to be a big time sucker. So it's going to have to have a very supportive um, either parents or spouse to be able to even try to do this. OK, so. You get that calendar, you feel it out, and you start to see what the reality of your situation is. When we know that reality, then we can start setting up a logical progression of things that we need to study. And so if you're in a school, you want your homework to accompany sometimes what it is that you're training in school. So if you're out of school and you're taking a heavy head semester and you're taking four portrait drawing classes and one portrait painting class at home, you have some options. You can either repeat more of that kind of training to keep your head information coming up, or you can actually um, intersperse it with, say, doing some figure work because you're already doing enough head work in class. So we have to start becoming intelligent about how we think about what we study, what books we study, what we study from, and then learning to allocate our time to be able to find the time to do that training. So what I tell people is, you know, you're taking four classes with us. So you got some 18 year old kid. I said, OK, pretend like this is a part time job for you. So you're in class part time. That's 20 hours a week. At home, I want you to do another 20 hours of homework. So now you've got 40 hours a week that you're putting into your training. That's pretty good. That's a really good amount of time. But that's very rare for somebody to be able to do that unless they're, again, really young with supportive parents that understand. And, they're, and, and then to find a kid disciplined enough to be able to do that at that age is really hard too. So most of you are going to be doing this on the side of a job after hours on the weekends. And you're going to have to schluck it out like everybody else, 95% of the other people. And you will make it happen. But that's why it takes so long to get good and become a professional. It might take 15 years if you're doing it that way. There's no way around it. I mean, it just is what it is. So when I tell people when they first come in, the first maybe, say, year to three years that you're at the atelier, it's a 70-30 split between drawing and painting. 70% drawing, 30% painting. We teach a paint, painterly style of drawing. So you're learning to paint while you're learning to draw. And that's a really great benefit. Some schools are linear in their teaching of drawing, which means when you go from drawing to painting, it doesn't transition very well. And so it's almost like two different entities. And that's why a lot of people um, liken painting to painting and drawing to drawing rather than seeing drawing as painting and painting as drawing, which is the way we see it at our atelier. Um, so again, you have these components that you have to start to become aware of. Memorization through repetition, number one, okay? For a lot of you that are very intelligent, this is going to bore you to death, right? You're going to have to sit down and draw the same stupid eyeball 20 times, 50 times, okay? And it's just going to be hard for you. Now, some people like myself, which I'm very fortunate that I am somewhat OCD and that I have the ability to do copious amounts of repetition with no boredom whatsoever, okay? So that's why I gravitate towards certain athletic endeavors in my life. Certain things I excelled at were always repetitious things. If you're not gifted or lucky enough to have that kind of mindset, it's a curse and a blessing, believe me. But 
that's something that I have been able to play to my advantage is my ability to, to immerse myself in complicated things and do copious amounts of repetition until I get it. That's something that if you don't possess that, you will need to cultivate that. And that is going to be challenging. Okay. Some of you are going to be other things, you know, um, intelligence in art is absolutely necessary, but it's not as necessary as it is for say maybe engineering or certain, um, uh, neurophysics or something. I don't know. There's areas where those aptitudes would be stronger. So sometimes the most intelligent people I meet are some of the most difficult to teach to become intuitive in art because they think too much about it. They use, rely too much on their analytical brain rather their, than their intuitive aspects of their intellect. And so we'll get into that more in the later stages because that's when that really starts to play out. So again, in this first first uh, year to three, you're going to be doing lots of learning uh, to prioritize, learning to multitask, learning to allocate your time, learning that memorization and repetition are key, and emulation. Emulation is another big one. Emulating is the fastest way to proficiency, in my opinion, in the visual arts and in other things. Find someone who already knows what you want to do and is incredibly good at it. And if they're willing to teach you, glue yourself to them like gum on their shoe and stay with them until you understand these concepts. That is the fastest way to proficiency is to, if you can go, you want to play golf and you happen to be able to go to a golf, driving range and hang out with Tiger Woods every day, watch his swing, watch his mentality, hear him talk, get to understand how he thinks, watch how he prepares before he, everything. That would be like you had died and gone to heaven, right? So a good atelier with a good instructor is like that. You get to come in and train with some guy that's at the upper echelon of his craft and you get to be with him all the time or her and get to absorb that information. That is extremely rare. Like the people that are at our atelier, me, Eric, the rest of us, you will not find more than a handful of people like that of that caliber that will do weekly training uh, of somebody that's brand new that can't even hold a pencil. I mean, I, you know, you're not going to see Richard Schmidt doing that, right? Um, you're not going to see hardly anybody of that, of that caliber doing that. So that's another thing. You, when you find that, man, go there. But um, uh, if you can't, go online and train with me. You know, try it for a month. If you don't like it, cancel. It's cheap, it's efficient, and it's like in a Rolls-Royce education for a Hyundai price. You got to try it. You got to try it. Um, so the third thing is, is cultivating taste, developing an eye. So when someone comes into school, I am going to put their eye in place. How am I going to do that? Through demonstration, through articulation, verbal and visual, through sitting on their drawings, fixing them for them in front of them. Okay, you painted the eye. Now here's what I would do. I will paint it, make it look 50% better. You remember whatever percentages that you can. Chances are it's going to be a small percentage in the beginning because your visual memory is going to be weak. So we need to cultivate that. We need to strengthen that. Just like going to the gym, you got to build the muscles. How do you do it? Through proper training and through repetitious training until the muscles strengthen. You've got to challenge the muscles as they get stronger. You can't just keep doing the same thing. Otherwise, you stagnate and flatline. Same thing in art. You've got to keep pushing yourself into higher levels of learning, harder techniques, harder methods, harder topics that bend your brain inside and out. But this should be fun for you. If that is not fun for you and you don't enjoy the challenge, you may not really be doing your life's passion, your life's work. You may want to look for something else or you may want to just do art casually, but I'm not good at teaching casual artists as much because I just, I don't function that way. You know, I, I, I want people to learn. I want, I'm assuming that they want to get good. I'm assuming that they're hardworking. I'm assuming I'm making a lot of assumptions. When, when I meet people, and, and I got to be careful that way because a lot of people do lack discipline. They do lack focus. They are procrastinators. They don't normally self-educate well. They don't self-motivate well. Um, they don't, aren't extremely disciplined. They don't allocate their time well. I mean, I could list 50 things that uh, most people possess. And these are things that we have to overcome. And this is one of the, the greatest things in your art journey is in training is going to be facilitating and putting in place the things I just told you because those are things that are going to help you excel in every area of your life relationships, business, and I don't care what you go into. So that's something that training will help. Focus, patience, and discipline is the last one. Focus, patience, discipline. Okay, these are things that everybody has a hard time with. I don't care who you are. Focus, very difficult. Things that can help, meditation, yoga, um, things that require that you focus your energy, right? This is not a cult. This is not something crazy. This is not out there in left field. Meditation is simply focusing the brain on a single thing in order to strengthen the ability and resolve to focus uh, in a one-point area. 
you know, not have your mind racing all over the universe. Okay. So patience. Um, oh my God. I mean, this is going to help. Oh, you have to have it. You have to have the patience of Job. Um, discipline. You have to be willing to get up every day, fight the good fight, work through the hard days, work when you're sick, work when you're not feeling great and, and enjoy it. Enjoy drawing the head over and over in three quarter. Find the love of it. Find the, the, the love of the feel of the pencil on the paper, the passion. It's not about, oh, I got an A, look, or, you know, hey, I just passed this class. That is such a rudimentary way of learning. It, it's, it's, it's passe. It's obsolete, in my opinion. It does not work in art. It, it, is, it is no place. So I don't grade. Why? I don't believe in it. If I have to leverage you through grades to get you good, you're not going to make it, period. It's not going to happen. You're not disciplined enough and, y- you know, it's not going to work. So I don't even go there. For me, when people come to the atelier, they're there because they want to get good. They've already been through, you know, the, the, the rigmarole of organized education and, and, and whatever. And it does work if you want to be an accountant, you know. It doesn't work if you want to be a painter. So, um, so what we got is for the first um, one to three years, that's what I call the early years in your training. It's all about getting proficient at drawing because you want to you get good cheap. And the best way to do it is through drawing, not through painting. Painting's expensive. It's time consuming. It's difficult. The concepts are the same if you teach them the same in charcoal. So you can still dabble in paint, but we got to get a nice foundational component put together. So that's your foundation years. So that's basically your first Early years is about all those concepts I just mentioned. It's about discipline. It's about focus, it's about allocating your time. It's about learning to understand what you're getting into and not try to master anything. Just try to um, embrace where you're at right now. You don't have to be a master. Be a, Like Robert Henry said, be a master at whatever level you are, however little that may be. Just embrace what you have and just continue to work progressively up higher and higher. So the next thing we're going to talk about is your mid years, which is, uh, you know, year three to five or six, somewhere in that next three years after you're starting to get your foundational components put together. So um, we will talk about that momentarily. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about our early years of training and what that's going to encompass and what we're trying to do. We're trying to put our eye in place. We're trying to get disciplined. We're trying to learn how to allocate our time. We're trying to learn how to grasp this idea of repetition and how much repetition is actually going to be. Now, this repetition aspect will carry on through the rest of your life. And the thing that the middle, the next couple years, I've noticed in students at our atelier, because a lot of our students at our atelier will stay from between probably the serious ones on average, five years, some five to 10. And some of those 10 year ones become teachers of mine. Uh, So they start teaching seven years in, eight years in, um, usually co-teaching with me about five or six years in. And then about seven, eight years in, they start to carry their own classes. And then about 10 years in, they're able to actually carry a class at our atelier with the same kind of, um, of, of level of proficiency that uh, I would want for a teacher at our atelier. Um, so there's not many people at our atelier that ever teach because no one ever stays around for 10 years. But I'm happy to say that all my present teachers are about 12 plus years. Eric's going on 19 years. So it's such a healthy environment that you do have people. No one ever wants to leave it. They usually have to leave it uh, for financial reasons or because they absolutely have to move somewhere for a job or something. But, um, and that's another reason why I love the, uh, the online atelier, because I'm now able to uh, go back to these people that did have to leave and say, no, man, you can now finish your training with us. You can actually go and do all the things that, that, that you wanted to do that you never had time to do. So uh, when you were around, so years three to five, three to six, somewhere in that mid range, we're talking about, um, proficiency now, right? We're starting to get used to this idea. We've kind of dedicated ourselves to this idea that we do want to get good. We've um, been at it long enough to know that it's not going to be a quick fix. It's not going to be uh, some magic brush, some magic concept that somebody bestows upon us, some teacher at some specialized time. It just, you start to realize it's just plain old intelligent hard work and perseverance. And the people that end up be doing it at the end are the ones that are still standing, the ones that learned that it's a journey that they're supposed to. And it's such a cliche that, in, you know, it's the journey, you know, enjoy the journey. It's not the destination. You know, you hear that all the time in, uh, you know, spiritual texts and stuff like that, but it's so true. It's so true that it's really about loving, learning and expressing yourself in a very authentic manner. And we all, I think really from a very soulful level want to do that, but we don't always know how to do that. So when we talk about proficiency on this next one, we're getting into 
um, artistic intelligence, right? Um, we're talking about not only intellectually knowing what we're doing, but knowing, starting to learn how to feel about what we're doing, getting in touch with our feeling about color, our feeling about composition, our, what intrigues us, what, who do we like, what artists resonate with us, what techniques or methods seem to speak to our soul. Is it a very tight uh, Bougarreau style, or is it a, a fetching, broken color, dry brush, uh, chaos style, you know, controlled chaos style? These are all things that um, we have to start uh, tuning into. And a good school will help bring, our good teachers will help bring those to you. Um, I remember seeing Fetchin when I was at school, and I think, well, not seeing Fetchin, but seeing a book on Fetchin when I was probably 21, 22 years old. And I didn't know what to do with that guy's work. You know, I saw the book, it intrigued me, I bought it, I put it on the shelf, I didn't touch it for another 10 years. Turns out that that book would ultimately signify one of the most pivotal turning points in my career uh, stylistically uh, when I was ready for it. But I had to prepare myself for a long time before I was ready to understand that. So proficiency and efficiency, right? Um, what is efficiency? Well, it's learning to be smarter. We're still refining that ability to allocate our scarce resources, time and money. We're, we're learning to sacrifice certain things and be okay with it. Um, sometimes these are very difficult decisions that have to be made. Sometimes you pick the wrong spouse, God forbid. And maybe that person doesn't agree with your, um, your personal legend, right? Where you're going, your artistic journey, your journey uh, of your soul, what you want to do for a living. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, sometimes you might, that might have to go away before you can continue on your journey. And that alone might derail you for years, depending on, um, if you do, if that is something that happens and then you have to then pick up the pieces behind that, uh, pick your, put yourself back together and then go back on your journey. Uh, that can be tough, right? That can be really tough. This is the reality of our training. Training takes place as life takes place. Life doesn't always agree with your, or doesn't always um, just roll over and give you on a silver platter what it is that you want. And a lot of times it'll probably challenge you uh, it, to make sure that that is indeed uh, your true calling. And so uh, when you do, it's something funny happens when you set in motion an intention of a very deep, soulful level. It's as if the whole universe conspires to help you on that journey. But at the same time, it challenges you to make sure that you're worthy of the rewards at the end of that journey. And the rewards in the artistic journey are greater levels of insight, greater levels of intuition, greater appreciation for beauty in general in all areas. <clears throat> um, these are things that should be close to everybody's hearts, you know, I mean, because it is what really shapes the world in a positive way that we live in. Um, so the artistic journey, a lot of times I call it, um, and this is the last one I want to talk about in this section, was the artistic journey itself. Because now you're far enough into the training to understand that it is a journey. It is going to take a long time. It is never going to probably <clears throat> fully end because you will always be uh, either maintaining skills that you once learned or learning new skills that need to be learned in order to propel forward. So as you go forward, you have to go back and continue to train in your earlier training to stay good at those things as you add new things on. So if you start thinking of your uh, artistic journey uh, from a training standpoint, you're talking about becoming multi-fluent in many, many visual languages. It's not that dissimilar from verbal languages except it's easier from the standpoint that the common denominator, the alphabet of all the languages of painting, drawing are the same. An edge is an edge, a value is a value, a shape's a shape, yeah, across the board. I don't care if you're doing it in pastel, oil, acrylic, digital, a hard edge is a hard edge, right? So we're lucky that way. Whereas, you know, obviously the grammatical alphabet for Chinese is not the same as Russian, is not the same as English. So I do make that correlation a lot in class that it's it's like learning languages, but I do want to make that 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 comparison that it is a little easier. But at the same time, you have to give it a similar respect uh, that you would uh, speaking multiple languages. Like someone who comes in and says, oh, "I speak ten languages," you would you would pretty much think the person was a genius. Um, but if you came in and said, I, "I speak ten visual languages," people wouldn't even know what to do with that. They'd say, "Oh yeah, great. What what, what does that mean?" It means I know how to speak charcoal, gouache, oil, 
digital um, uh, casein, uh, ink. I mean, these are all different languages, right? And they all require lots and lots of time to perfect them, to master them. So um, when you look at your artistic training in these middle years, you want to start figuring out what burn rate do you have? How much time can you uh, really donate towards this kind of course of action that you're taking and whether or not you should start to specialize? And I'm not a big fan of specializing only too early because um, I think it be, you kind of can become a one trick pony, so to speak, you know, where you're, you're good at one thing. And the, the biggest problem I see with that is that you could burn out. Um, I do think at some point you do have to specialize, pick your strength and probably pander to it. And you may have to do that sooner than later if, if your finances dictate or your life dictates. Some people will go into becoming a portrait or a landscape painter because it's a little easier than portrait and figurative um, to become proficient at it. So they'll go out and they'll hang their hat on that. But, you know, after you've painted, you know, 2,000 rivers, streams, and mountains, you're probably going to be wanting to paint a head or a figure or something. But if you're already a professional making money at it, it's very difficult to put in an, a head that's 50 times less uh, developed than your landscape and still save your reputation, right? So you kind of get in this conundrum where you kind of paint yourself into a corner, so to speak. And that can happen very easily. So in your student years, you want to try to formulate being strong in your major areas, um, still life, landscape, figure, portrait, at least proficient in all of them. And then there'll always be one of those that stands out over the others as your true passion. Um, I happen to like all of them equally, um, kind of weird that way. And I've spent lots of years getting good at all of them. And there are certain areas that I do am a little bit obviously better than, in, than others because I do spend more of my focus time on those. But I've managed to bring them up to a very high level and maintain them, but that's only through huge amounts of practice and repetition and going back and repeating. I happen to do that through teaching, but I also do that on my own. So um, when we're talking about, again, our training, which is what this is about, we are talking about now being fairly far into the training program, having put in a fairly good eye and hand, having the eye and the hand actually being having more of a symbiotic relationship. In the beginning, you're eyes going to be up here, your hands going to be down here. The two are going to be arguing incessantly while you're trying to beat them into submission through practice, proper practice. And then as they encroach on each other, the eye will jump forward. And it's like teasing you. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm there. Not really. Boom. If you've ever hiked the Grand Canyon, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. You get to the first line. <laughs> okay, cool. There's the top. You get there. There's another one. Oh, shit, man. I thought that was the top. Four or five hours later, you're at the next one. Oh, good. I mean, it's a, oh, there's another one. And it goes on like that forever, you know, and it's just boom, boom, boom. And every time you get to the one plateau, there's another one that's five, 10 miles off that you go, oh, you got to be kidding me. Um, and art's very much like that. And again, it's like you want your art training to look like a good stock. It goes up and then it flatlines and it goes down a little bit, but then it goes up even higher. And then it, then it kind of tapers off a little bit, but then it goes up again. And then it kind of goes down a little bit, but it's still way higher than it used to be. And then it goes up, you know, and you're just always on an upward trajectory. You don't want to flatline for a long period of time or go all the way back down. Why does that happen? People stop training. Oh, my life got difficult. I got a new job. So I had to stop drawing for three months. When you go back to drawing, you're going to have to spend three to four months getting back to where you were when you took the three months off in order to get moving forward again. And if you keep doing that, you keep hitting the ceiling and you never get any further, right? So you just kind of end up not really doing that nice trajectory in an upward trajectory, which is what we want. The way we do that is to be pragmatic, realistic, and consistent. Key, consistency. Get up every day and do something. Look at your checklist. Make a long list. Headlands, uh, under heads, headlands, skull, sorrow head, uh, Riley abstraction. Boom, boom, boom. Features, eyes, nose, lips, ears. Make that list. When you fill out that schedule I told you about, fill in. Oh, head days are on Mondays, Wednesdays. And on, on Wednesday, I have a head class in the morning and I go home and I do another three hours at home uh, of some area of head practice. Awesome. So you're getting in like six, seven, eight hours of head a week. Your heads are going to be getting really good. Your figures are going to be sucking wind. Your landscapes aren't going to be getting much better, but your heads are going to be coming up. We want to bring everything up together if possible. Sometimes that's not possible. So what we want to do is constantly think, got to go to that checklist, got to plug it in, got to follow through, got to follow through, got to sit down and do the work. Don't read a book on drawing, draw the drawings in the book. If the book doesn't have good drawings in it, get rid of it. Doesn't mean anything. 
got to have good images to study from. Uh, secondary, I would read a book, but I only read a handful of art books. You know, I think, uh, you know, um, Loomis's Creative Illustration, uh, Richard Schmidt's All Prima, All I Know About Painting, um, you know, things, books like that. Those are books worth reading. Um, Harold Speed's book on drawing and painting techniques. Uh, those are this Practice and Science of Drawing, and then there's one on painting as well. There's a handful that I would actually read. The rest of them, you find books that are chuck full of images that you can copy, get into your head, remember them, and use them to do your own paintings of a similar caliber, okay? So we're now at about six years in. You're well on your way to proficiency. Mastery is still way off in the distance. Um, intuition, way off in the distance. But you're starting to catch glimpses of it. You're starting, things that you were repeating early on that you're continuing to repeat, hopefully, are starting to be second nature. Don't fall victim to thinking that that means you never have to study those again. Still respect the fact that you will maintain them, but you only have to do a fraction of what you did to learn them to maintain them. And all the time you're doing this, your visual intelligence, your visual memory, your ability to remember what you draw and see is getting stronger and stronger with each passing day, with each week, with each month, with each year. So now what used to take 20 times or 30 times drawing to remember is taking five. Okay, so what you're starting to do is you're starting to get that train moving, right? When you started, you're, you're trying to get a train that's so heavy moving, it's moving at a snail's pace. Once it starts picking up speed, you've got all that inertia of that weight of that train behind it. It is hard to stop that thing. And it is moving so fast at that point that you can't, it's hard to stop it, right? It takes a long time to stop it. So that's where you're at now. You're starting to get, the train is now really moving and you're on it. Be thankful you're on it. You're on the right train. You're moving in the right direction. You're not going in the wrong way. And so you're going to make it. It's just a matter of time. But by this time, six years in, you should have a very, very sincere love of the craft of training. And if you don't, you probably have quit already, right? And that's fine. Not everybody is going to, you know, there's an old saying, you know, many are called, but few will answer. You know, sometimes you get into it, you know, you're still going to benefit a lot from even trying to do art. And if you want to do it at a more casual level, God bless you. I mean, don't worry about it. I'm talking, we're talking specifically right now about people that are aspiring to become high end working caliber professional people of the highest level. Okay. So it, you could take any of these things I'm saying and just temper them to your own interest. So when you come in, and I didn't mention this in the first part, when you come in, ask yourself, are you a dilettante, a dabbler? or someone that wants to be a professional. Because we have to determine, there's nothing wrong with being a dilettante as long as you know you're a dilettante. What is a dilettante? You like dabbling, you like playing around with it, but you have no interest in the kind of effort that it's gonna take to become phenomenal at it. The problem is that a lot of dilettantes think they're professionals or think that they're on the path to profession, uh, professional and they're nowhere even near it. And that's when you wanna go to a book like George Leonard's Mastery. It's a book on mastery and it talks about the principles of mastering things and who masters stuff and who never will based on their personality types, based on the type of person they are. And that doesn't mean you quit, but it might mean a hell of a lot of work to get yourself to become a different person than you actually are in order. And so a lot of this training is going to be tough love and it's going to be based in reality. And sometimes people don't want to hear the real deal. They don't want to hear that they're lazy and procrastinate and that they're really not that disciplined. They thought they were really disciplined. Then they meet some person that is, and they just say, oh, that person's freaky talented. Oh, that per no, that person's probably an OCD-driven um, hard worker that concentrates and focuses intense amounts of energy on one thing for many, many, many years and masters it. That's hard work. I don't care if you're wired that way or not. That still requires that you sit down, you do it, and you, you organize your life to be able to do it. So anyway, um, that's kind of where we're at in these three to six years is we're really starting to get some meat into our training. We're really starting to understand the process of training. We're starting to build a really good library and a studio. You need a nice clean place to work. It doesn't have to be lavish and extravagant. You'll find um, that that may be something you aspire to someday, but you also need a library from which to study from. And again, that library might be the online school, right? It might be you using my the, the what I put into that program, which is 30 years of knowledge, so that you don't have to go out and find every one of those books, gut them, figure them out, and then try to learn it on your own. That'll take 10 times as long as it would if someone that knows what they're doing just laying it down to you and saying, here's what I want you to do. Here's how I want you to do it. Here's how much I want you to do of it. Now go to this one. And that only came from trial and error, um, sweat and tears, uh, getting beat up, getting um, 
wanting to quit. I've been through all that stuff and I've helped endless people through it. Um, and I love doing it. That's my passion. My passion is to help people help themselves. That's what I love doing. Now you might think, oh, this guy is too good to be true or, you know, he's full. Yeah, you'll have to make that decision for yourself, but look at the videos, watch them and tell me I phone anything in because I do not do that, right? Um, So anyway, uh, the next one we're going to talk about is our more mature years of training, which are, you know, probably, you know, six years to 10 to 15 years in, uh, it it starts getting really fun. I mean, even in that mid second, it's always fun, but in that, when you start becoming, when the ideas in your brain start coming out better on paper and canvas than they were in your head, something changes. It's a tipping point that occurs that just says, man, I can't get enough of this. I want to do more of it. This is what I was born to do. This is what I I want to share my vision with the world. And it could be any number of visions, but it's your vision. So, but we have to give you the tools with which to make that vision even um, able to be digested by other people, able to be enjoyed by other people. Okay. So uh, next one we'll be talking about is the year five to 10. Okay. So now we're getting into the later stages of training, which is actually the rest of your life. I mean, cause you'll be training your whole life. And that's one thing I try to tell people when they come in, I said, this is not a definitive, uh, anything. Uh, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know, the more you want to train and it becomes a cycle, but it's a positive cycle. It's a cycle of growth, learning a lifetime of learning. Nothing is more depressing to me than thinking that I'd be sitting in a cubicle doing the same thing, not learning anything, phoning it in, uh, just finding ways to pretend like I'm working throughout the day and uh, know my job so well that there's no challenge whatsoever. And I just, that's my life, right? And I get in my car and I drive two hours home and I drive two hours back the next day and do the same thing. Couldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. I'd sell coconuts in the Caribbean first before I would do that. I would do anything but that. But um, the artistic... Uh, personality is a very, I wouldn't say volatile, but it's very interesting. It's really one of the more unique, I think, beautiful personality types. Um, But it has to be tempered with logic and with intelligence, because otherwise you find those real bohemian, you know, I'm going to cut my ear off, uh, you know, traumatized. Um, uh, The the old saying, um, the tormented artist, right? That's just slightly out of their mind, slightly this, slightly that. It is true that most of the really good artists that I do meet that are actually working artists are very cerebral, level-headed people that you would not at first glance know were artists. They don't present themselves with, you know, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this because I love tattoos and all that kind of stuff, but, you know, they're not all tatted up with nose rings and, um, you know, you'll find some guys like that that are, but some of those are just people that don't really fit in and then they'd say they're artists because they don't really fit in and that's not a real artist to me. That's someone that's got other issues, you know? So um, artists are free thinking a lot of times. They are bohemian. They have tendencies towards the unorthodox or living a more unorthodox orthodox lifestyle. But none of this is bad stuff. That's actually really cool. Um, the key is trying to learn at this higher level what it means to be an intuitive artist, intuitive knowledge. And, and that is something that I found is very difficult to find information on unless you go into maybe self-help or um, some of the more realms of spirituality and stuff. You won't normally see a college or a school of academia teaching intuitive learning. Um, People are aware that it exists. It's becoming more common now as we understand more about the brain and as we get more advanced in the sciences. I think uh, this next 100 years, you're going to see a complete paradigm shift in how... um, our understanding of, of learning and the, the layers of learning and that what exists is yeah, we, we are kind of operating within a very confined area of intelligence, um, whether it's whether it's psychic ability or, or maybe more telepathic or, or just the ability. The brain is such an, a complex, amazing tool that we know so little about. When you get into the arts at a high level, uh, I had a friend of mine, a little bit of a non sequitur here, but a friend of mine, it'll come back around, a friend of mine that took classes was a, a PhD from Princeton, Princeton, and he was a neurophysicist. And I mean, we're talking off the Richter scale, intelligent individual, um, and great at physics and all this stuff. And, and when he came in to train with me, he thought he would break me down into an algorithm, learn how I think, apply it and get really good. Well, that sounds great from a science standpoint. That sounds very logical. And maybe that would work in science, in certain areas of science. 
But what he realized and what I realized through training him for five to six years full time, and he did become a teacher of ours, he became very proficient, but he had an extremely difficult time becoming intuitive. He did not operate, in my opinion, all that well on an intuitive level. So everything went through logic, everything went through thinking, and it was very difficult. If I told him, okay, I want you to feel your way through the painting. I want you to paint what you felt when you looked at the Soroya you saw years ago. I want, when you're painting, I want you to be able to look at your painting and feel the same feelings you got when you saw that Soroya, knowing that your painting is going in the same direction because you can feel that same thing. That is painting more from an intuitive level. Yes, you're using intellect. Yes, you're using technical proficiency, but you're using a deeper level of soulful feeling in order to navigate the abstractions of colors, the manipulation of color. So painters like that are Nikolai Feshin. Um, there's a slew of them out there. Uh, Dean Cornwell. I mean, painters that paint with broken, you know, Cornwell would pick up red, blue, green, yellow, and then he'd pull a stroke. You cannot tell me that there is any way in this universe that you could tell me what exactly is going to come down off that brush when you just picked up five things randomly. The only thing that could help dictate what's going to happen is intuition. That's it. A feeling, a gut feeling. Where does that feeling come from? You tell me. You tell me if you can explain that. In science, there would be no explanation. Therefore, it does not exist. Right? Can't prove it. Eh, what do you know? It doesn't exist. We know it exists. We know people are intuitive. We know what happens when you have a gut feeling about somebody or a hunch. These are things that um, some people are very much more intuitive. They're much more able to cultivate that aspect. Artists usually are in the realm of intuition. They're very intuitive learners. Um, they're intuitive people. Um, doesn't mean there's anything between, an, you know, you're not going to find probably an accountant that operates on that intuitive level. Is there one out there? I'm sure there is. But chances are they're going to be very compartmentalized thinkers and they're going to work in a very confined manner because that's what how they operate. You couldn't operate in that industry being thinking outside the box as much as an artist would have to, right? So the main thing is, is at this level, we are now starting to get into more ethereal aspects of training. And how are we going to cultivate that? Are we just going to sit and draw more eyes? Are we going to draw more heads? Are we going to paint? Yes, we're going to do that. Of course, we're going to do that. We're going to do that for the rest of our life. But as we do that now, we're going to try to inject into this technique or this knowledge and these academics that were the first part of the training, a different component, a component that cannot be taught in a school, cannot be read in a book, has to be found within oneself. So we now get into this idea of the art, true artistic journey. And it's a spiritual journey. It's a journey within oneself to understand oneself, to become authentic. I am still knee deep in the middle of this journey. So I'm talking from a level of experience where I have done the 30 years of pick and shovel, daily training, weekly training, monthly training, yearly training, in and out every year, every day for, the, for my, most of my life. So I am not here talking to you from hypotheticals. I'm not talking to you from what ifs. I'm talking to you from I have felt it. I have paid the dues. I have the scars to show from it. I have the strength and intuition to show from it. So when you watch me demo, you watch me paint online, you're going to see I'm talking, I'm thinking, I'm painting. How can you do a good painting and be talking about philosophical aspects that require one side of your brain to completely be operating at a full level while the other one's operating on some other level, which doesn't require thinking. That's called intuition, right? I'm painting intuitively. I don't have to think about it as much. Now, I'm not saying it makes me a perfect painter or anything. I'm just saying I spent 30 years learning how to do that. So I know what it feels like to put that in place. I know how rare it is. I know what it's like to operate that way. And I, I value it greatly. Because what I would hate to do in my career personally as an artist is just be another technician. Now, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. And some people will have to hang their hat on that because they won't have the time to incubate long enough to become an intuitive painter. So they're going to have to become a formulaic painter. And uh, is that the most exciting way to paint? Not for me. You know, don't like it. Don't want to do it. Um... Is it hard to make a living uh, as an intuitive painter? Yeah, a lot harder. Why? Because there's no consistency. And what people want consistency. They want to know that you're the painter of Indians. You're the painter of little kids on the beach. You're the painter of 
whatever. They don't want to see you switching a style every day, changing this, changing that, even though that's what's fun for an artist. An artist wants to explore. They want to grow. They want to experiment. So in these years, you're going to be continuing to do your technical training. You're going to be continuing to go back and train in things that you did from the first year. You're going to go back and study skulls. You're going to go back and revisit the sorrow head. You're going to go back and study anatomy. And you should have been studying anatomy those whole 10 years. Cycling through arms and legs once a year for three months. Our, um, torso front and back three months every year. And you do that year in, year out, studying slightly different ways, studying new um, techniques. And, and in between that year, you did 50 other life drawings. And in those 50 life drawings, you applied what you learned about the torso that last year and learned a lot more. So now when you go back to study it again, you have a whole nother layer of knowledge that you put on top of that. So what we have here in this, we have uh, intuitive knowledge, which has to be is starting to be cultivated in this maybe six, seven, eight, nine years, ten years in, you're starting to look into soul searching. Uh, what does soul searching mean? It means really delving into your authentic self, and this is where most people are going to get really run into a lot of baggage from childhood, a lot of issues, and they're going to have to start weaning through and 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 getting a really good understanding of who they really are and what really is valuable to them. If they want to have something to say that has meaning that's going to exist 100 years from now, 200 years from now, 500 years from now, why can't you be the next sergeant? Why can't you be the next Frazetta? Why can't you be the next Fetchin? There is no reason. You're no different than they, well, Frazetta may have had some capacities that are different than ours or, or some of these guys. But what I'm saying is that don't sell yourself short. Proper training is the key to success. Success can mean lots of different things to lots of different people. So training is different for each individual. Don't cookie cutter it. Don't go into school thinking, oh, that I need to train like this specific manner. Challenge your teachers. Challenge yourself. Challenge the um, uh, method. I don't just teach the Riley method. I teach the Watts Riley method. I took the Riley method, took what I understood about it, turned it on its end, wrapped it upside down and backwards, redesigned it, and then jumped off of it. And I'm hopefully improving or at least adding something to it. Now that's what you should do. You shouldn't just teach a method because that was the method that was taught to you. You should teach it with the idea that you're going to add something to it, something contribute something to it. I always say that you're going to be one kind of artist. You're going to be the artist that people avoid or the artist that people want to copy. One or the other. So, you know, be one of those artists that people want to emulate. You're emulating artists to get good. Someday someone will be emulating you, you know, why not? So anyway, so at this stage, we're doing um, authenticity work. We're doing soul searching work. We're doing intuitive work. And we're also still developing comp uh, fundamental skills, which we will be doing for the rest of our lives. But as we get into these further stages of development, we will find, I think, if you really are in it for the long haul of mastery, that you can't ignore the philosophical slash spiritual component of drawing and painting. And so at this time, about, you know, say 10 years in, I wish to tell Eric or any of these guys at my school, about 10 years, you know, you could be working professionally three to five years in, but it's not going to be one of those incredible jobs. It's going to be an entry level job. It's going to be kind of pick and shovel. It's not going to be the most inspirational, probably. Um, if you're in gaming, it might be some, you know, or, or animation, it might be in betweening, it might be back, you know, so it's going to be stuff that's not like visual development concepting, which is the Rolls Royce job, right? So it's going to be about 10 years before you're doing those kind of jobs. Um, if you want the job where you're having fun, getting paid really well and doing all that, which everybody wants, it's a 10 to 15 year stint if you're doing all the right things and you're working regularly and no one wants to hear that. Everyone wants to hear that I'm going to go to a four year university and I'm going to come out working at Pixar. Not going to happen. Almost put any amount of money on it. Um, it's not going to happen. So that being said, uh, the best thing that could happen from this podcast is just, it's a reality check. It's inspirational, I hope. It may be also a little sobering. It may be, uh, hopefully it's not depressing. Uh, it was not intended to be such. It was, to, it was, it was, it was intended to be um, pragmatic. That's my thing. Um, I'm the, a lot of times the bearer of, I'm, I'm, I'm just the messenger. You know, I'm just, you might be able to do it faster than me, but I learn really fast visually. I mean, really fast. And I always did. And so when I met certain people, they'd say, oh man, you have a gift for this. You have a gift for that. Um, I know how fast you can assimilate some of this stuff. And I have seen in 20, 30 years, certain people, I've seen the fastest people, man. I mean, I've seen, uh, and I've seen, and they don't always, they don't always make it. They don't always make it. Um, I've seen some of the less talented people naturally 
far exceed the most talented people I've met based on work ethic, character, and just hard sweat and tear can handle it. You know, just tough people, man. Tough, heart tough, strong, willed. Uh, I would take that any day over naturally talented and lazy. Okay, so at this point, you know, you're 10 years in, you know an awful lot about yourself, you know an awful lot about what it takes to train well. You're starting, you've probably already worked professionally now. You've had jobs, you've been in and out, you've seen the positive negatives of the different industries you've been in. And you should start to be able to formulate a really good idea of what you really want to do with your skills. Because now you've tried animation, you've had an, um, you've done book covers, you've done some storyboarding, you've worked a little bit in the illustration uh, market, you've done some fine art, you've been in some galleries. You know kind of what the topography feels like to be out there working. And you know how hard it is and how challenging it is. But you also know how rewarding it is. So at this time in the artistic journey of training, your training becomes still more focused, more intelligent. You know where your shortcomings are and you don't avoid them. You actually strive to work more on them and less pandering to your strengths. In the beginning, you always want to do the things you're good at because you get a lot of accolades. People tell you, they build up your confidence, they they stroke your ego. These things help you to, um, they play a very valuable role because they help you to continue on. Uh, you don't want to continue on if everyone's constantly berating you and telling you you suck and you're terrible and you're not good. What would make you want to go on? You have to be an incredibly resilient individual to power through that. And so um, a lot of times you'll find yourself pandering to strengths and avoiding the weaknesses because it's human nature. So at in this last stage are these stages that, that go from like, say, maybe seven years, six years to 30 years of doing it or whatever. Um, it's all going to be more and more about continuing to refine your craft continuing to refine your understanding of what it is you want to do with the skills that you've spent so long developing and learning to be um, a spiritual artist, you know, someone who uh, is very truthful about what it is that they want to say. And they've spent lots of time getting the skills to say that so articulately that their message can be understood, not almost by anybody, but from any language, from any culture. And that is the cool thing about art is when you go see the David or you go see the Mona Lisa, which, you know, is not top my top five, but um, some of Soraya's great paintings, I don't care, sergeants, whatever, whoever you, you want to hang your hat on for being your favorite painters. It wouldn't matter if you were Chinese, if you were Russian, if you were um, from Mars. Well, maybe it would, but if you're these areas, like it doesn't matter. You're going to get it. You're going to see it. You're going to see the colors. You're going to see the brush, bravura brushmanship, the composition, the staging, and it's going to speak to you. And it will speak to generations from here on out for the, until the end of time because it possesses the humanity of what makes us human. Artists are the people that do that. They remind us of what it's like to be human what it's like to have compassion, what it's like to have empathy, what it's like to have sympathy, what it's like to be part of the human race. Without the arts, laboring humanity would perish because it would all just be about labor, working for nothing, just to work. The payoff is in the art, right? The architecture, the great art from the past. People, what do they do when they take a vacation? They go to Florence to see the Sistine Chapel, to see... Bernini's work, to see the Vatican, to see uh, the David. What if none of those artists ever took the artistic journey? So what, what, ha what would happen if, if, if Michelangelo had never wandered or found the atelier that he trained at with the master? He would be a frustrating stonemason. He would have had this incredible potential to produce some of the best work humanity has ever seen, and it would have been nothing, right? We would have never had those great pieces of work and what a travesty. I mean, can you imagine what that would have been? Uh, what, what, what a loss for humanity that would have been. You could be the next Michelangelo. You could be the next sergeant. You could be the next Fetchin. Don't sell yourself short. Training's where it's at. You've got a life ahead of you. Take it by the reins and just f go for it. You know, don't listen to the naysayers. The naysayers might be the people closest to you, and chances are they're going to be. That's the most painful part about it. Your own parents don't trust you. Your own wife, husband doesn't believe in you. You got to believe in yourself. And even in spite of anything and everything, follow your personal legend. Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. 
But in order to do that, huge sacrifices will be made. And that's life. Nothing we can do about that. But we can do it with panache. We can do it with respect. We can do it with a sense of um, honor. I call it fighting the good fight. Because when you take a journey like this, it is going to basically uh, bring you to your knees. It's, it's, it's the universe's way of testing you to make you worthy of what it is you're doing. And it, and again, to me, it's just, it's everything. It's my whole life is wrapped up into the concept of what it is to be an artist. And it, it, it permeates every aspect of my um, being in every time, every area, every second of every day. That's what it means to me. So my life has been designed since a very young age in spite of many naysayers. And I had to do exactly what I just told you. I had to believe in myself when no one else did. I had to follow my heart when nobody else would. I had, and that is what makes you strong. It's what makes you unique. It's what makes you, um, I wouldn't say special. It just makes you, it's envied by many people that have not taken that journey. So when that, when you see someone that is on that journey and is walking that journey, all you can do is take your hat off because you know that's what everyone should be doing. Now, it may not even be in the arts, but whatever your personal legend, your personal journey is, you should be taking it. You may try this art thing and it may not turn out to be your personal legend. It may not turn out to be um, the hero's journey. You know, it's just something you tried. And that's fine. There'll still be enrichment. There'll still be growth. There'll still be a lot that you'll garner from it. But for those of you who are after the brass ring, you know, you're on the journey to professionalism. This hopefully will be a very meaningful podcast for you because I was never told any of this stuff. When I went to school, sit down, draw a little bit. Here's a model. Good luck. Go home. No one told me anything. <laughs> I had no, I mean, literally. I now went to a great school and God bless the school I went to because it was the best I could find at the time. It was California Art Institute, Glenn Orbick. These guys were phenomenal, but it just wasn't part of the curriculum. It wasn't, this part of it was something I brought to my own atelier from other parts of my life and things that I value as much as my art, which is uh, my spiritual growth, uh, thing, learning things about myself. I've always been an avid learner of myself and I always will be. And um, that has been a different component that I have injected into art training that I had not seen up till that point, at least not with me, Robert Henri, right? Didn't talk about him. What, what that shame on me. Cause he, again, you know, you've heard me talk, uh, do some of his readings in the beginning of some of these, uh, earlier videos, the art spirit, but one of the best books you could own as an artist. It's the art. It's what I would, if someone said, what would your legacy want to be? If someone said you we're going to be held in the same esteem as Robert Henri. I would, that's so much more important to me to be a famous painter. Famous painter? Create, helping create tons of famous painters. Helping to facilitate the growth of generations of famous painters. Helping to uh, put uh, on the path people to enjoyment that will last their lifetime. That's what it's about for me. So, you may see me be a famous painter someday. I may see myself be a famous painter. I don't really care. I hope so. But uh, the online school, the education that I'm putting forth for generations to come, that's my passion. That's where I'm putting my energy. So um, hopefully you'll feel that, you'll see that and what I do, and you'll make your own uh, you know, decisions uh, on, on how you want to train. But hopefully this helped shed some light on your options and that... Um, you know, just follow your heart. I know it's hard to do sometimes, but just silence yourself, sit down, go inside, and it's all there. You'll find it. So good luck. I hope to see you in the program, uh, either at our atelier or online. And, uh, you know, keep pushing play and keep fighting the good fight. You'll do fine. Thanks for joining me.